Today we've got a very special episode of Intel because it's all about the pinnacle of aviation, the Concorde. British Airways Concorde, the first supersonic passenger airliner to fly with more than twice the speed of sound. First, best, and fastest. For me, the Concorde is a really special aircraft. Just look at it. This isn't a normal passenger jet. This is style. It looks different because it was. It flew at twice the speed of sound and at more than 11 miles high. And it did so in the 1970s just a few decades after jet aircraft had first taken to the skies. To think that flying like this was possible in the 70s and now there's nothing like it is just incredible. Here's something you wouldn't see on any other passenger aircraft. You've got your Mac meter that passengers could see telling you how fast you're going and people would applaud when it got to Mac 1, Mac 2. The hallmark of the Concorde was its speed and the height it flew at. From the windows you could see the curvature of the earth, and it could even outpace military jets. You would actually be able to feel the heat from the, from the walls and from the windows of that air pressure and that air resistance against the aircraft. The exciting bit was the takeoff. You felt that original thrust that pushed you back in the seat, and then when the aircraft got to 50 knots, the four reheats lit up together and you got another push back in your seat. But the Concorde wasn't just about speed, it was also about class. It was either a once in a lifetime flight or part of a millionaire's regular commute. Rock stars, movie stars, businessmen and bankers all flew across the Atlantic in the Concorde. A nice glass of uh, Bucks Fizz or Dom Perignon Champagne, the Philip steak, the best vintage port. You arrived at Free Meeting in New York very relaxed. <laughs> and you, let, you arrived there three hours before you'd taken off, because New York was, is five hours behind. What made the Concorde special wasn't just that you were travelling at twice the speed of sound, it's that you were doing so in a business suit, sipping champagne, no flying suits and no oxygen masks. It was military travel for civilians. This is Heathrow Airport. And behind me, in an old staff car park, is actually a Concorde and its final resting place. And it's actually, it's actually a reminder that this aircraft that we all think of as a massive success, it's a British icon, it actually wasn't a success. In, in many ways, it was a failure, and that's why it's in a car park. So what was it about the Cold War era that made such an expensive experiment possible? Well, while answering that, I'm going to race the Concorde. Driving the same route from London Heathrow to New York JFK. And this is my noble steed for the race, the Volkswagen Turan. Obviously, it goes without saying that I am not going to win this race. But for me, that's not really the point. What I want to do is demonstrate just how quickly it could cross the Atlantic. And now I really wish I'd parked the car facing the right way to start the race. As if the Concorde didn't have enough of a lead already. I'm stuck in this street. Here we go. We're free. Supersonic flight isn't easy. There's huge technical challenges. Basically, as an aircraft gets faster, the drag and resistance increases. So supersonic aircraft need much more power and much better aerodynamic designs. But supersonic flight also isn't new. In 1947, American test pilot Chuck Yeager became the first pilot to fly faster than the speed of sound in level flight. Less than 50 years after the Wright brothers' first flight, man had broken through the sound barrier. 
and advances in jet aircraft were about to kickstart a technology race in long distance bombers and reconnaissance aircraft, but also for the first supersonic airliner. It's easy to see why. In the late 1950s and 1960s, when Concorde was first being designed, it was only a few years since the first jet airliners had revolutionized air travel. Flying above turbulence, at faster speeds, and with longer range. Supersonic flight promised to do the same again, getting to destinations quicker and flying higher still. In some ways, it was the next logical step. The, the Second World War really accelerated uh, research and development into the aircraft industry. You know, it compelled faster engines. And so in Britain, there was a sense that you know, we're losing our lead in this kind of capacity passenger-based airline market. So we need to look ahead into the idea of speed. Speed. It seemed that the direction of civil aviation was ever faster aeroplanes. And the other key point was that the advocates of Concorde argued that, look, even if this is slightly more expensive to operate than subsonic alternatives, those first class passengers will pay um, for the speed. Um, and, and that's why airlines will have to buy it and run it. That was always the argument. Throughout this time, Britain had been making huge advances in the aerospace industry. During the Second World War, British designed and built aircraft played a major role, producing some of the most effective warplanes ever flown. Towards the end of the war, the British produced one of the few jet aircraft to see service during the conflict, the Gloucester Meteor. Its aviation industry had grown hugely in the Second World War, and now, as the world moved into the Cold War, those companies were vying to design the next great fighters and bombers. In 1949, Britain had even produced the first jet airliner. In the 1950s, British designs took lessons from German wartime research, and soon, Delta wing designs were being used on aircraft like the Avro Vulcan and the Gloucester Javelin. After the war, there were loads of airfields where people had been building military aircraft. And then obviously after the war, those orders dried up to a large extent. So people started to try and use uh, aircraft which had been designed for military applications for civil. The next decade ended up being largely an era of cancelled projects and bankrupt companies. In 1957, a government white paper stated that all manned aircraft would be replaced by guided missiles by as early as the 1970s. At the time, air combat would have been between high-flying bombers carrying nuclear weapons and interceptor fighters trying to stop them. But the paper anticipated a stark change. With the advent of the surface-to-air missile, later that year, the space race would hot up as Sputnik was launched into orbit, proving that soon, nuclear weapons would be able to be launched on missiles too. Numerous aircraft were cancelled prematurely, most of them supersonic designs. The English Electric Lightning was spared, but only because it was too far along. It would become Britain's only ever UK-designed and built Mach 2-capable fighter. The British had their English Electric Lightning fighter in production and the Lightning II was providing information of flight at the speeds recommended for the new airliner, Mark 2.2. The cancellation of aircraft projects continued into the 1960s. Companies were amalgamated, there was political infighting, and expensive supersonic projects were axed. Like the TSR-2, a strike and reconnaissance aircraft that would have dashed in under the Soviet's radar to deliver nuclear weapons. The companies, they would lose their patience because they were being offered different specifications all the time. There was different competing uh, interests from the branches of the military. There was industrial pressures, there was political, you know, depending on the, whoever was in government, whoever was in a ministry, you know, the, the policy could be, could be rap rapidly different. I mean, what we now know is that the aircraft industry is heavily capital intensive. So much so that we really, in the world today, we only have a handful of aircraft building companies. So at the time, that wasn't necessarily recognised. I think a really important part of the story is that this is a tragedy of strength. That it is precisely because Britain 
um, has this difficult role as being a scientific world leader, but not really on the same scale as the United States, that it has these incredibly ambitious projects to try and leapfrog um, the US that, that ultimately fail. So, so it's that mix of strength and, and too much ambition that can only come from strength that I think leads um, to tragically um, 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 cancelled projects and, and, and uh, commercial failure. So right now in the Concorde, you'd probably be having your drink service. You'd, you'd have seen your menu for the, the in-flight meal you're going to have, your three-course, four-course, whatever it was, dinner. And, and I'm in the miserable rain just outside of London. A year before the government's white paper cancelled a number of supersonic aircraft, it had set up a supersonic transport aircraft committee. Its goal was to develop a supersonic transport design and find partners to build it. One area new missiles couldn't affect was civilian aviation. The early studies of a supersonic airliner had been ongoing for a number of years already. But advancements in the slender delta wing design was changing aircraft companies' understanding of what happened at supersonic speeds. The 221 will help to investigate aerodynamic properties and handling characteristics of the slender delta. We used the ferry delta II as a test aircraft that we converted with a delta wing, high pressure hydraulic systems, tall landing gears, and we used that for a flight test aircraft. Work began on finding partners for what was sure to be a hugely expensive project. France and Britain decided to team up. It was a political decision and marked the start of the biggest international air project since the Apollo missions. Harold Macmillan, um, who was the Prime Minister when the Anglo-French Treaty was signed in 1962, was by this time looking um, to join what was then called the common market. Um, and so he thought that building an Anglo-French supersonic jet would help with his application. It didn't, of course, but that was the idea. It was this binding agreement that perhaps was the only reason the aircraft wasn't cancelled. The development project was negotiated as an international treaty between two countries, rather than a commercial agreement between companies, and even included a cause imposing heavy penalties for cancellation. A draft treaty was signed on the 29th of November, 1962. We had to learn French for a start, <laughs> which was very interesting. And obviously the French were, were working in millimetres. We were working in inches. The French would put, do all their drawings in millimetres and they would put the inches in brackets in conversion. So every drawing on the French had the millimetres in the inches. Our drawings had the inches and they had the millimetres in brackets afterwards. The experience gained from those cancelled supersonic military aircraft would come together into a new breed of airliner. The aircraft they designed and manufactured was a masterpiece. Innovations had to be made everywhere. It had engines derived from a Vulcan bomber that were completely rebuilt to make them twice as powerful. The Cold War aircraft was even used as a test bed for early Concorde engines. Subsonic operation of the engine air intake system has been investigated with this Vulcan, modified as a flying test bed for the Olympus 593. The wings took months to research and design. They had to reduce drag, but also provide enough lift at slow speeds. The slender delta wing generated a vortex on the upper surface. And because of the high angle of attack needed for landing, the whole nose moved. We had good engineers. We had excellent engineers. We had dedicated people working long hours and determined to succeed. You're not just saying that because you were one of them, are you? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Airlines were initially impressed, agreeing to buy the new jet. With so much innovation, how could the Concorde not be a success? Well, money. It was costing much more than airlines were willing to pay and the economics just didn't add up. I mean, even in the mid-1960s, the British Overseas Airways Corporation, the sort of precursor to British Air, um, Airways, told Whitehall that, look, um, this is going to be considerably more expensive than the subsonic um, jets that we already have um, in service. So it was pretty much always obvious from the airline's perspective, from even the British airline's perspective, that this thing was not going to be, um, be able to operate commercially. 
So what, why, did, why didn't they cancel it um, in the mid-1970s when it was very clear that subsonic jets were going to be the future? It would have, seen, it would have been very difficult for the government um, to cancel Concorde because they told the British public for so long that it was going to be a commercial success. The cost of supersonic flights and rising fuel prices meant that airlines couldn't make a profit. This, coupled with environmental issues and concerns about sonic booms over land, meant that few flight paths could even use the Concorde speed. Airlines that had agreed to buy the aircraft slowly pulled out, leaving just the UK, France and Iran. All three likely stayed in because of political reasons. The Concorde Treaty that had been signed by the UK and France meant that neither country could pull out of the project. Instead of hundreds of Concorde being produced, in the end, only 14 were used commercially. In the mid-1960s, the advocates of the aeroplane were thinking there would be about 450 sales. The factories in Toulouse and Bristol were told to build three Concords a month, um, and only 16 um, commercial aeroplanes ever go into production. This is an incredible rundown um, of the project. It's often said that the decisive issue with, with Concorde was the oil crisis, and the oil crisis mattered because Concorde used about three times as much fuel as subsonic um, jets. But actually the real problem came a little bit earlier when the American, um, big American airlines cancelled their Concorde orders. Once those American airlines cancelled their Concorde orders um, in the start of 1973, that pretty much all the other um, airlines followed suit. And by the end of the year, you're looking at really orders potentially from Iran, potentially from China, um, but even in the end, they, those orders petered out as well. So that's been about three and a half hours and right now the Concorde would be touching down in New York already. A normal jet airliner might actually be halfway across the Atlantic. And I'm just shy of Manchester, at Manchester Airport actually. Well, cheers. cheers. The Concorde was a masterpiece. Made possible by huge advances in the aviation industry, driven by the Cold War. But now it's a relic, a museum piece that hasn't flown for more than 15 years. The reason is largely due to its economics. After 30 years in service, it was costing even more to maintain. Besides, the future in aviation hadn't been in flying faster or higher, but instead, and getting more bums on seats and driving down costs. It didn't really make any sense for Airbus, who then had the maintenance contract, to focus so many of its resources on um, maintaining so few um, aeroplanes. So ultimately, it was economics that um, killed it in the end. I mean, there, there were obviously other factors in play, but in the end, it really was about Concorde's own economics. My son, he said to me, he said, uh, how am I going to tell my, my children their grampy flew to New York in three hours, 20 minutes, and yet now if we want to go, we, it takes us eight hours. And I said, well, you've just got to say one word to them. It's uh, Concord. <laughs> in 2000, an Air France Concorde crashed in Paris. Then something happened that changed the aviation industry for years to come. A lot of the bankers, time was money to them. They had the 3,000 pound to pay for their Concorde flight each way. And when they had destroyed the Twin Towers, they killed a third of British Airways and Air France's frequent flyers. So the revenue from the aircraft went down dramatically. Concords were flying to and from New York with virtually no passengers. The aviation industry took a huge hit, and the Concorde, with economics that were already so finely balanced, simply couldn't survive. It's ironic then that this incredible feat of engineering 
made possible by Cold War advances, a sort of child of the 60s, met its end when the world entered the next era of global conflict, the War on Terror. Since the Concorde was retired in 2003, supersonic flight has only been possible in the defence sector, where budgets are huge and not driven by profit. Before COVID-19, the world might have been ready for that to change. Companies are once again looking at the viability of supersonic travel, this time for the few that can afford it. Whether that continues, time will tell. Thanks again for watching Intel. If you like these videos, then be sure to subscribe and leave me a comment, especially if you ever got to fly in the Concorde. Don't break our Concorde. I'll try not to. <laughs>